Would you please welcome one more time, Dr. Matt Ritter. Tom, thanks again for another great introduction. And thank you all for uh, having me here. This is the last talk of this conference, is that right? All right, congratulations on making it through right here to the end. It's also kind of nap time at 3 p.m. And, uh, and so I'm proud of you all just right here at the beginning. We'll see what happens. Uh, I'll, do, I'll do the same thing I did last time, which is if you want to interrupt me, yell out, totally fine. I don't, I don't consider that rude or anything. I believe that the opposite of stupidity is curiosity. So if you have questions, most everybody does. And so please, uh, please, this is a complicated topic and I've tried to streamline it as best as I can. And it could be a thing we could talk about for hours and hours and I get 50 minutes basically. So we'll do what we can and, 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 and we'll see how it goes. And, and, and I'll, I would like to start by, by talking about roots and the, and the difference between roots and shoots. Earlier, I talked about shoots and, and I talked about shoot apical meristems and axillary buds and nodes and attachments of leaves and so on. Well, well I'll, I'll talk about roots briefly and I'll do so by juxtaposing the difference between roots and shoots. I think that's a good way of going about it. And in fact, there are things, there, roots and shoots are, are very similar in some ways in the sense that if you have a large woody root and a, and a woody stem, I bet you couldn't tell those apart. You, you, you wash the dirt off of a large woody root and, and you look at it closely. It's got bark there. It's got secondary growth. It's got a vascular cambium. It's got all those things. And they're, they're very difficult to tell apart at the woody stage. But out at the end of the root areas where you're having primary growth, they're very different. There are things about them that are, that are very different. And, and uh, the conduction portion of roots, though, tends to be uh, much more similar to stems. So what are roots doing out at the tips? Well, in general, roots are holding plants to the substrate. You can think of it as a, a physical hold-down anchorage situation. They absorb water from the moist environment, which we call the soil. You hope it's moist. And they conduct that water through the root system towards the base of a trunk of a tree. The water then moves upward from there, and we'll talk about that. But also roots are doing storage in a way that stems are not. They, st they store a lot of starch in a way that stems are not. And then like stems, roots are producing hormones in different, in different ways. And we could talk for a long time about hormone production in different portions of plants, but roots do produce hormones. And so roots have a root cap uh, that is uh, that actually protects the apical meristem of roots. So very different than the shoot apical meristem. The environments that these two things are in are very different. It's very, it, it, you can grow through the air and not get damaged in a much different situation than growing through soil, not getting damage. So the root apical meristem is protected from its environment. And it also has a, a, a slimy mucigel around it that lubricates it in the environment. Roots don't have any nodes. They, uh, and they have specialized epidermal cells called root hairs that, that, that increase the surface area with the soil to allow for water uptake. So that, that, um, that slimy mucigel that's around the root, root cap that lubricates the root, is, root tips as they push their way into soil in the new soil environments in the search for water is an important component to what's going on at root tips. Also at root tips, the root cap is, it is sloughing off sales, cells constantly. It's being renewed and sloughing off cells constantly. It's being renewed by the root apical meristem. The root apical meristem doesn't only produce all the things that make up the root, but it also produces the root cap constantly as a root is pushing through the, through the soil. The root epidermis, so all portions of plants are covered with an epidermis, a skin layer around them. And those skin layers are very different, different parts of the roots. They're different in leaves, the root, the leaf epidermis has stomata and we'll talk about that stem stem epiderm epidermis also has stomata somewhat but we'll we can go into that but the root epidermis at the absorbing shoot uh, so at the absorbing tips of the roots has these specialized hairs they're they're single cell outgrowths which we call root hairs you can see some some um, pictures of them there and absorption is facilitated by these these root hairs and um, and really root hairs are just single cell projections that increase surface area. 
surface area is so important in plants. Because I talked about the difference between plants and animals in the earlier talk, I'll do the same here. And what, I, what I'd like you to think about with regards to plants and animals, to get out of your animal-centric way of thinking about the world, if you think about what plants are, they are big, fixed surface areas, massive surface areas, where animals are little mobile volumes, mostly parasitic on plants. Who cares about them, right? Well, those big fixed surface areas, they, 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 they have to be massive surface areas because they come in contact with the environment through their surfaces and, and water and gas exchange happens through surfaces. And so, so where in your body is there a big fixed surface area? Your, your lungs and your intestinal tract, right? Why is that? Well, you, 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 that surface area is very important for absorption, right? So absorption of gases or absorption of the, all the stuff you stuff in your, your mouth all the time. I really like to think of the human body like a donut, right? It's got a big hole in the middle. And the, you're not actually, when you put something in your mouth, it's not inside your body yet at all, right? And if you can think about it that way, that, that you, you have this hole in the middle and, and, and inside your body is then, then everything gets absorbed to the actual inside of the body through the intestinal tract. So big fixed surface area on the inside of you and this small little mobile volume. And animals, they're just plants inside out. That's where the, uh, all the surface area is. So there's your plant animal comparison, but that fixed surface area idea comes back over and over again when you talk about everything from the ecology of plants to their biochemistry, all of that. A, a plant germinates in an area and then it's done. It's gonna stay there. So how does it manage the world? Well, with surface areas and branching and going out into the environment and, and interacting with it. And then I showed you that in the vasculature, that's the xylem and phloem, it's moving throughout the plant. It's moving throughout the plant. And it's in the, it's in the stems, it peels off out into the leaves, all the way into the smallest leaves out into the shoot apical meristem. Well, uh, an interesting thing happens at the root shoot boundary of trees, of plants, of, uh, of, of young plants. This is an example of a model of a young plant, what's going on. And so you can see that you have vascular bundles there, vascular bundles moving out in a ring at the stem. And those converge at, at, at the root shoot boundary. They converge at the root shoot boundary. Was, well, why is that? Because, well, it's the small roots at the tips. The vasculature is not in a ring in the outside of those small roots, but it's in a central column. And it's in a central column for a specific reason, also because of the environment it's in. It's absorbing materials into the root from the environment, and there has to be some filtration there at that point. And I'll talk about that with regards to filtration, but the root vasculature is different. It's central rather than diffuse as it is in, it is in the stem. And the root vasculature, if it's central, what is it? Well, it's xylem and phloem, but it's a, but it's a central column of radiating alternative xylem and phloem in that column. And you can see that right there, xylem, phloem, xylem, phloem, xylem, phloem in, in the central column, radiating arms, alternating strands of phloem with xylem. And they're surrounded by this cylinder called the pericycle. And that pericycle is meristematic cells, undifferentiated cells that can grow and divide. And it points on that star of xylem and phloem, where xylem and phloem are together, the pericycle can actually grow and divide and make a new root. And interestingly, totally different than how branching happens in stems, in roots, branching happens from the inside out. It has to push its way, a new branch, because of the, it needs a connection to the vasculature, a new branch in roots, has to come from the inside. It can't come from the outside and because the, the connection to the vasculature has to be maintained. And so a lateral branch emerges from the inside of a root, pushes its way through the cortex and the epidermis of, of, of the parent root from which it's branching, and then grows a new root apical meristem and all of that. And so if we take, there's a cross section of a root in the upper left-hand corner with a branch coming from the inside of it. And you can see it's pushing its way through, through that. And then here's cross sections of actual stained cells of a root. 
where there's that in the upper right hand corner there, there's xylem and phloem. Xylem um, is this, xylem are the large red thick celled walls, uh, thick walled cells here. Phloem is alternating between them. There's, there's some paracycle outside of that. Outside of that is all what we call the cortex. That's the storage tissue and roots. And so if we look at that cross section, we can see some interesting things. One is that there's this band of really dark cells right around the xylem and phloem. Band of dark cells around the xylem and phloem is an interesting thing. And, and we call that band of, of dark cells. In this case, it looks like a band, but it's actually a cylinder around, around the xylem and phloem. The name for that is the endodermis, the inside skin, you, you, you would call that, in which the endodermis is this, this single layer of cells here. They're tightly packed together. They have the shape of boxes. They're very tightly packed together. And the cells themselves are surrounded by a wax layer. That wax layer is a specialized name called Casparian strips. And if you surround cells with wax and you stick them together, what it does is it makes it impenetrable to water. So when water gets picked up in those root hairs that I talked about out in the soil, how does water get in? Well, water just sort of osmoses its way in. It goes from high concentration in the soil to lower concentration in the cells of the plant, high concentration to low, low concentration. Water is a very small molecule, so it's moving its way through cell walls. It might cross a membrane or two, and it's finding its way towards the center of the root. And we'll talk about what actually is going on as, as water is being pulled up. But if you looked at the path of water from the root hair to the center of the root, could be all over the place, could actually never enter a cell, could, could just go through the cell walls, between the cell walls and so on, never really entering a cell until it hits that layer, that endodermis layer, in which those tightly packed cells have wax around them. And the water has to, at that point, cross a membrane. And membranes, in all membranes in, in all cells in the world, what are membranes doing in cells? Well, they're a selectively permeable barrier. Part of being alive is to separate what's outside of you from what can get inside of you. That's a, a tenant of being alive. Got to separate the outside world from the inside world. Things can't just spill out. And so membranes are doing that and they're selectively permeable and they allow for water to get in, into the inside, but they don't allow for other things to get in. And so there's a, there, there is a filtration of water going on, fungi, viruses, disease particles, other things that, that the entire, that, that if they get through these cells, then they have access to the entire rest of the plant. That endodermis layer in the roots is crucial for that, that it allows that to happen. And so these Casparian strips of wax around the endodermis layer have evolved. And they've evolved in all plants. In fact, all plant roots have these, so much so that everything that didn't have it is gone. It's a good way to think about evolution. Everything that's, that, that didn't evolve that, not in the gene pool anymore, gone. It's a crucial adaptation for being able to separate the soil environment from the vasculature and the rest of the entire plant. Because once water gets into that vasculature in the root, it goes through the xylem, into larger and larger roots, to the base of the trunk, through the trunk, up into smaller and smaller trunks, branches, and out into the leaves, and then out into the environment. Water is then pulled upward. And, and let's talk about how water is pulled up. Or once water enters that vasculature sure, from the root tips, it's just conducted. And what does it mean to say it's, it's being conducted? And how does water get up to these, to, to, to the top of tall trees? Let's talk about that. I got all kinds of questions and I'm gonna list a couple of them here. We'll go over them together, okay? So here's some questions. A maple tree loses over 50 gallons of water per hour from its leaves. How does such a volume of water get supplied to leaves? So much water goes up into to, to trees that sometimes on a hot day under a large, oak tree, and I've had this experience in California many times, some of you may have had it elsewhere, you can actually, it's colder and more moist under that tree than it is just 20 feet away outside the, under, from being under the canopy of the tree. Well, what is that? That's just a ton of water coming into the environment and, and from this tree through the body of the tree out into the environment. The tallest trees are over 350 feet high. How does water get up so high? 
that is a, a, a fascinating question. And you could ask most of the general public of America to, 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 you could ask them that question and they would have no clue. You could say, if you put your ear up to the, the, just to the trunk of a tree, do you hear all the pumps running in there? You guys have cut trees open. Have you, have you found the pumps yet? Right? How does it happen though? How does it, how, if you think about those redwoods right there, that's an eight foot wide column of water that weighs more than this building going upward at a meter an hour sometimes. It's an incredible amount of water moving, moving upward. And how does it happen? And how do sugars that are made in that canopy and made in all the leaves, how do they get transferred to other portions of the plant? Is an interesting question. And the last question I'll ha I have for you is, why go to Mars? <laughs> if you think about this, I think about it quite a bit is, it, it, you know, Mars, we're fascinated by Mars, right? We, we um, you know, from movies to NASA budgets, to billionaires building their own rockets, wanting to go there to look for their planet B or whatever. We seem to be thinking about Mars all the time. And um, you can actually go to NASA's Mars exploration page and you can get today's weather on Mars. Today's weather, as far as last time I looked it up, there was a high of 19 and a low of minus 90. You get the most recent images, you can get the, uh, you know, like the changing distances from the sun and so on. And the scientific papers of the expeditions abound. Here's one that's, that's the perennial water ice identified on the south polar cap of Mars. This is in nature. It was a big deal when, the, when they found that. Here's another one in which th this, this says spectral evidence for hydrated salts and recurring slope linea on Mars, which is a very fancy way of saying they found the evidence of erosion from a while ago. It looks like it was created by water, right? And, and, and I think the cover of National Geographic got it right that, that Mars, what are, we do, what are we doing with Mars is we're trying, to, we're trying to figure out, are we all alone in the world, in the universe? Are we, is there life out there somewhere else? And because water is such a strange and wonderful molecule, we can't even envision a way that life exists in the absence of water. And if we're looking for life, really a proxy for looking for, for life is, 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 is looking for water. And a lot of Mars exploration is about trying to find places where liquid water exists because potentially life has evolved separately and totally differently on Mars, but it's really unlikely to have evolved without water as, as the basis for, for it. And back here on the planet, water is the most abundant resource on the planet, yet it's the, the, the most limiting resource for plants that live on land. Water is so, there's so much water everywhere, but so much of it is unavailable to all the plants that live on land. And, and, and you can see this here, but this is, is a movie we created with NASA's vegetation index data from 1981 to present. And you're seeing one image put together from every month for about 25 years. And what we call this is the pulse of the planet. This is when water becomes available to plants, you get vegetation. And you can see, uh, look at the Intermountain West pulsing barely, right? Kind of dry, but there's parts of the Amazon that are not pulsing at all, kind of vegetated constantly. And look at Siberia. That's in the summer in Siberia when water becomes non-frozen and available for all, those, uh, all that tree growth. The planet is pulsing. The planet is pulsing in so many different ways, but it's also pulsing with water availability. CO2 comes out of the atmosphere when water becomes available because photosynthesis is happening. And, and, and all of that's true. And you can tell the ecology of different places just because of the availability of water. This has been published over and over again. Here's an example of a paper, which is a meta-analysis, meaning an analysis of a bunch of different things showing that how drought tolerant a tree species is determines the assemblage of the plant communities that, that make up the vegetation that we see all over the planet. And then water in specific at the, at the level of individual plants is incredibly important. Here's a coleus plant that is just not watered for a week and then watered and watch how quickly it rehydrates. Boom, right? Plants have awesome adaptations for dealing with water loss, where they can 
They, they can shut everything down, stop making stuff. Just don't die in the absence of water and hang on because it's coming. And that, that many plants evolved in that kind of situation in which they have these great adaptations for, for dealing with short periods of drought. And we know this as well from an agricultural irrigation point of view. What do you need in order to grow plants? Well, you need some soil, some sunlight, and CO2. But you also need another crucial thing, which is water. Sunlight, soil, and CO2, they're everywhere. But what's not everywhere is water. So what, what we do with agriculture is we move water around to make it to make it so we got all four components to be able to have good water growth. And, and, and we know this is crucial. And water, you have to understand water before you can even understand movement of water through trees. This is an unusual molecule, you guys. It's, it's heavy. It is, uh, it's a polar molecule, meaning it's got a slightly negative charge on one end and a slightly positive charge on the other end. It's the closest thing we know to a universal solvent in the sense that it sticks to almost anything. It's got, you gotta be a really oily molecule to not interact with water. And, it, and, and because of the slight polarity in the water molecule, it sticks to itself and really hold on to itself. We call that cohesion. Adhesion is sticking to everything and cohesion is sticking to itself. And it's a bizarre molecule in a number of ways, but here's a crucial way in which it's weird. Think of yourself for just a second and think of yourself uh, on a hot day and you're sitting on a porch and you have a cold beverage in your hand and it's got ice in there. Let's call that beverage iced tea, okay? You're enjoying an iced tea on a hot day. And it's a glass and you're holding it and you go like this with it, clink, 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 clink. The ice cubes are moving around. Where are the ice cubes in your drink that you're picturing right now? They're at the top. You ever think about how weird that is? The solid version of the molecule is less dense than the liquid version of the molecule. There are so few molecules like that, right? Solid, solids are usually more dense than liquids, but water, it's not that way. Water becomes less dense as it gets, goes to a solid form. And if that weren't the case, life would not be possible on the planet, right? Because what would happen, the polar ice caps would, sit, would sink, the top of the oceans would, would freeze and sink and freeze and sink until you would have planet ice. With around the equator, you would have a little bit of thawing. But because water has this weird aspect to it, it makes life possible. It makes possible all kinds of crazy things that happen on the planet. And one of those things is its ability to move large distances upward in trees has to do with its, its characteristics of adhesion and cohesion, which I'll get back to. Another thing you need to know in order to, to try to answer that question about how does water get to the top of tall trees is that uh, diffusion and osmosis are happening all the time everywhere. And it's a very simple thing, which is molecules, which are not really, really cold, molecules at temperatures that are prevalent on Earth are always moving. And they're moving from high concentration to low concentration. And, and, and that's what the, the diffusion, that's the definition of the diffusion is molecules moving from high concentration to low concentration until they reach some kind of equilibrium. There's a special kind of diffusion when which waters, water molecules or things move across a membrane, we call that osmosis. But high concentration to low concentration you know it, you see it. If somebody sprays some perfume in that side of the room, it's gonna end up over here eventually. And that's gonna be dependent on the temperature in here, the distance, all these things that affect diffusion. And then ultimately they also defect, uh, affect osmosis. And if, and if you just look at this as a, a, a sort of a thought experiment in which you imagine dropping some water that had, that had a 10% sugar solution into it, into a beaker of pure water. And then putting this semi-permeable membrane in which sugar can't move through that membrane, but water could. Can you picture that situation? Well, what's going to happen is the water is going to move from high concentration to low concentration. And it's going to work against the pressure exerted by gravity in that column until it comes to some kind of equilibrium. And, and in explaining water in plants, people use a thing called water potential, which is a combination of pressure potential and solute potential and, and all these things. And I'm not, I'm going to avoid that. 
I'm going to, I'm going to constantly say water is going to move from high concentration to low concentration. So if you add 10% sugar to a solution, you've just effectively reduced the concentration of, of the water there. So water is going to move from high concentration in the pure water across the membrane. And because the sugar can't come out and equilibrate, you're just going to get more and more pressure inside that tube until the water uh, elevates. That's happening. And, that's, ha and that, that's an important thing that this osmosis and, and diffusion is happening because it happens in, uh, in cells. You can imagine a situation like this where a plant cell, in this case, gets put in either salty water or a plant cell gets in, into pure water. If the salt concentration is the same inside and outside, water won't move. But you put a plant cell in pure water, water is going to rush into that plant cell. You guys all get that? This is why it's really dangerous to inject a human with pure water. It can kill somebody doing that. It has to be salt water. Well, why? Because, because pure water will just burst cells. Plant cells have walls around them. Animal cells don't. Plant cells, you can think of a plant cell as a balloon inside of a box. In animal cells, they're just balloons. So they'll pop if they get in really pure water. Water will just rush in until it pops a cell. Well, that's not true of plants. What happens if you get, you, you get a, a plant in a pure water situation, water will rush in until the balloon expands and it hits the inside of the box, which is the cell wall, and it exerts a pressure against it. That pressure that it gets exerted against it, we call it turgor pressure. Turgor pressure is, is, is when you're seeing the rehydration and wilting going on there, it's the difference in turgor pressure, the balloon inside of the box at the cellular level, if water is rushing in, every single cell is exerting a pressure against that box that's around at the cell wall. And so you get this turgor pressure situation. And so turgor pressure is also crucial to understand when we're gonna answer the question here in a little bit about how water moves through, through tall trees. Another clue to think about is what does a leaf look like and what is actually going on in the morphology of the leaf? Well, if you take a leaf and you slice it and you looked at it on the, on the end, you would see that there was a, there's an epidermis, a skin covering on the top. There's a, that, that's the upper epidermis right there. There's a skin covering on the bottom, the lower epidermis. And between them is the green photosynthetic cells. And there's also vasculature in there. There's xylem and phloem. Remember, xylem and phloem terminates out in the leaves. It comes up through the stem and it peels off in the branches and peels off in the buds and so on until it ends up in the leaves. It has to be in the leaves because the leaves are where the sugar is being produced and, and the phloem's taking it away and the leaves are where photosynthesis is happening. So water is going there. So, so what's going on then in the leaves is that you have upper epidermis, lower epidermis, vasculature inside, and then all these photosynthetic cells where all the photosynthesis, photosynthesis process is happening. And if you notice in this figure that I'm showing here, you can see that there's some openings in the lower epidermis. It's not true of all plants. It's true of a typical plant that the lower epidermis has specialized opening and closing holes in it that we call stomata. And that's where water, most of the water that enters the tree is lost there from the opening of the, on, on, on the lower epidermis. So epidermal cells in general, they're like these box, uh, 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 sorry, puzzle shaped cells that are pe tightly packed together. They're pretty impermeable, but within them, there's two specialized cells that we call guard cells that open and close that allow for CO2 to come into the leaf for photosynthesis to happen. All those green cells on the previous slide, they need CO2 in order to make the sugar that's going on in photosynthesis. Well, they have to, so, so the stomata have to open up to allow for CO2 to come out of the, the atmosphere and go into a lower concentration CO2 environment inside the leaf. So CO2 will go from high concentration in the atmosphere to low concentration inside the leaf where it's being constantly used so it stays in low concentration. Well, what happens when a hole gets opened up in a leaf? All the water in it just begins to rush outward from high concentration in the leaf to low concentration in the dry atmosphere. And if it's hot, if it's windy, it's even, it's even drier. And the, and, and the concentration of water is even lower outside than it is on the inside. And so when water gets lost from leaf surfaces, 
usually the lower leaf surface, due to stomata being open. And leaves can lose 100% of their water in an hour, Plant and plants retain actually very little water. Most of the water that's coming up in the roots through the stems and so on just goes right out of the plant. And it's less than 1% of that water actually gets used in the photosynthetic reaction. To, uh, and it's a component of photosynthesis that's crucial. The plant will come to a screeching halt if it doesn't have that water, but most of it is just passed right through it. And what we call that water loss from, from leaves is transpiration. So that's the loss of water vapor from a leaf out into the atmosphere, that word transpiration. It's a little different than evaporation. That's why we don't use the word evaporation there because evaporation actually happens before transpiration. All the cells are coated with liquid water and then that liquid water evaporates into a gas inside the leaf. And then that gaseous water, when that, when that stomata opens, then go, that goes out into the atmosphere. And so using the word evaporation for what's going on in water leaving plants would be kind of inaccurate. It's actually transpiration. And you can see there's, there's the upper epidermis, the lower epidermis. There's all those photosynthetic cells here, the palisade and spongy mesophyll and so on. And here, right here is xylem and phloem and water is coming up out of the xylem. It's coating all these cells. It's evaporating to a gas inside there. And then these open up and water leaves out into the atmosphere, returns to the atmosphere and while CO2 um, rushes in. And plants aren't, are, are not just passive to be able to, to, to have this happen. They can actually control the opening and closing of stomata. In fact, potassium is tightly regulated in guard cells. Uh, it, it, it increases and decreases the solute potential inside guard cells. So if, if a bunch of potassium goes into a guard cell, water follows it in. Because what have you done when you've increased potassium in a guard cell? You've actually effectively lowered the concentration of water. And so water follows it in. And that cell becomes turgid. It pushes against the cell wall. And a good way to think of, I think a nice analogy for thinking about guard cells is a bicycle tire or a bicycle inner tube. If you blow that thing up, it opens up. If you let it, if you let it go limp, then it closes. That's how, that's how guard cells work. Water rushes into them, they open up. If water rushes out of them, they close down. And it's an adaptation for dealing with drought, obviously. So if water is rushing out, you get the guard cells closing and less water loss. Um, <clears throat> so now we know all that, let's go back to this question. How does water get so high up? How can water move? By the way, trees that are this big, they don't absorb very much water in their leaves at all. Small amount potentially, but mostly an irrelevant amount of water. Most of the water that's provided to those leaves, 380 feet up or whatever, at the top of this comes from the ground, comes out of the soil, up through that entire stem, and moves upward over a long period of time, eventually making its way to the leaves at the top. How does that happen? And how can it go that high? The explanation for that, the best explanation is called the cohesion tension theory. And what it, the transpiration drives the entire thing. So remember transpiration is the loss of water from the top of, uh, from the leaf through the stomata, water is moving out into the atmosphere. But it doesn't just move out into the atmosphere and not interact with any of the other water in the leaf. In fact, because water is sticking to other water molecules, as soon as a water molecule is pulled out into the atmosphere, it doesn't leave a hole behind it, pulls another water molecule into that position. That's a good way of thinking about it. Because water molecules are cohering to each other, they're sticking to each other in an unbroken chain of water from the roots all the way up through the stems to the leaves, as soon as the water leaves a leaf, it's pulling. It's pulling, creating tension, hence that word tension in the theory here, uh, and creating an upward flow of water through the entire thing. And a, and a way to think about the cohesion tension theory is here, in which um, you can start with, the with leaves at the top, water vapor evaporates as in, and diffuses out of the, out of the leaf. And then water is pulled out of the xylem when that happens. Because water is leaving the leaf, 
there it is adhering to other cohering to other water molecules and pulling water out of the xylem well that pulling of water out of the xylem in the leaf causes a tension in which water is pulled upward through the entire xylem of the stem all the way down to the roots where water is then pulled out of the cortex making water concentration low inside the cortex and then water rushes in from the soil through osmosis and all those root hairs that I talked about. And it's a powerful thing and it's driven by the sun. It's driven by the sun because without the sun, there's no transpiration. There's no evaporation going on. Leaves are not heating up and water is moving up in, in a tree and then the sun goes down and it stops. Sun comes up the next day and water moves up again. Yeah. So, so. Yeah. No, no. Okay. So, so, so cavitation is happening sometimes. Well, it's happening all the time in all plants. So, and, and a plant has to be in constant water, never have any drought stress to avoid cavitation. And in tropical trees and so on, cavitation is no big deal. Um, cell walls don't have to actually be very thick. Think about the balsa wood uh, picture I showed earlier. And, 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 but you can imagine this happening. An analogy for this is, is imagine pulling an icicle up. From, through a tube, right? This is water being pulled up through a tube. Well, the, it's, it's cohering to itself and you're pulling it up. But if there's a lot of friction in that tube, and in fact, there's very little icicle down here or it's very heavy or there's not very much water in the soil, eventually the pull happens till you get a break. And if you get a break in that column, that column is done. And what I mean by that is this water here, no longer attached to the top, drops off. This goes out. And now you have an area called an embolism or cavitation. The non-technical term is an air bubble, whatever you want to call it, that now water can no longer go up through that tube. And that tube actually becomes totally non-functioning. Partly heartwood is formed because cavitation becomes more and more and more likely during the life of, a, of, of either a long vessel element or a bunch of trachids. And, and eventually they just get filled in and new ones get made. And there is, and I think you asked about repair, potentially repair and the differences between conifers and angiosperms with regards to repair of cavitation. Oh yeah, yeah, no, the, the, the plants do not put all their eggs in one basket, right? Most organisms that are successful don't. There's many, many, many tracheary elements in conifers, many, many vessel elements that are, that are in the stems uh, of, of angiosperms or flowering plants. And, and so if you get a cavitation event in one, water moves around that. In fact, if, it, if, if cavitation actually happens and it becomes very cool and very moist at night, the cavitation can actually be repaired by water moving back in and, and, and just diffusing into that area. So cavitation repair actually does happen. So cavitation happens all the time, but too much cavitation over too much area in the xylem kills the tree. That's how, that's how trees die of drought. That is what's going on. The water is being pulled out of the leaves and no more water can be pulled up from the roots and you get breaks, you get breaks everywhere. And, and drought tolerant trees have all kinds of physiological, physical mechanisms for dealing with that. First of all, their leaves are, tend to be smaller. The, 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 the cells in the xylem tend to be, have thicker walls, all kinds of things that allow for, for um, cavitation not to happen as much. So it's a great question. And, and, and yes, yes, cavitation can kill plants and can kill trees, but for the most part, cavitation is only partial and, and trees survive it, yeah.
Yeah, okay, so I'm, I'm going to respond to that, that your observation of, of quick death in trees, or, and, and I'm going to respond to it in several ways. One is that we are very bad at actually recognizing things in the environment. What I mean by that is that, that you can't even tell individuals of, of, of within a species apart. Can you, can you tell if I showed you a picture of a ponderosa pine and another one, you could tell they were different individuals or not, all those types of things. We're just very bad at doing that. And there's a lot going on in the environment, subtle cues that we're not getting and, and death can happen but you're seeing the end of a long process that you didn't recognize until that long process. So people think things are happening quickly. Well, you're, you're just experiencing it quickly it, it, and, and that you didn't, you were ignorant of the entire first portions of that process. So that's one thing that, that sorry to call you ignorant in my answer right there, but, it, but it's a great way to answer somebody's question. You're just ignorant. <laughs> no, but that, that, um, that, that, so that's part of it, right? And another part of it is, and we see this, we saw this in California over the last five, six years with Ponderosa Pines, the, the environment became unsuitable for them in the Sierra Nevada foothills. And it became unsuitable to them over a long period of time, but there was a massive tipping point in which, in which, in which the water availability in the soil and the air in, in large portions of the range of that tree was just no longer available for those trees. So what happens in over, over a relatively short period of time in the life of a 60 year old tree, which is six months to a year, they, they have massive cavitation, drought, death, and, and uh, in plants, it's all death and life is kind of complicated as well in the sense that a sickly tree that's on its way to dying, what you end up seeing is the things that come to kill the tree you, uh, the you know paths and pathogens and um, and insects and you you name it right everything comes out of the woodwork to eat a stressed tree, but the stress is the thing that matters right and 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 oftentimes what matters is the stress of of drought and we've seen it so much in California where everybody sees all these new diseases and so on, and it's just drought stress so much drought stress is there and and for for sickly trees. And so that tipping point that you talked about is real, that happens. But I also think that we don't see the whole first, first portion of the process. So those are great questions. And, and, um, and thanks for interrupting me with, with regards to that. Um, I'll say that the sky has a very low water potential. The atmosphere has a low water potential and, and soil has in general, a high water potential or high concentration of water in the soil. Most environments in which plants are growing, the, the water, concentration of the soil is much higher than the, than the water concentration in the atmosphere and trees happen to sit in this sweet spot right between those in which they are they are drier than the soil environment but wetter than, than than the atmospheric environment and this is why salty soil can be so salt uh, so toxic right so if you increase salt content in the soil you've basically made the uh, really reduce the the Constant, if you increase the concentration of salt, you reduce the concentration of water to a point where um, it's no longer available to, to, um, to plants. And this happens in agriculture in which you get salting of, of agricultural soils and so on. So um, the current tallest known tree in the world is called the Hyperion tree. It's about 385 or 86 feet the last time it was measured. It's a ridiculously tall, tall tree. Interestingly, the Hyperion tree uh, is, in, is in a grove of trees all over 370 feet tall. So it's not abnormal for the place where, where it occurs in Humboldt County. But if you think of a tree that's 385 feet tall, that tree is about 2000 years old, estimated at about 2000 years old. Well, if it was 4,000 years old, would it be 600 feet tall? Is there some kind of maximum to tree height? It's an interesting question with regards to water movement in trees, and and, um, and people have answered this question. There's a paper here called uh, "The Limits to Tree Height: How Tall Can a Tree Grow?" 
that 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 paper was published in which they showed some of these answers and they used the redwood tree as a model system for for trying to study how tall could a tree go because you can make these in, this interesting observation in redwood trees and that's that there's different leaves at different heights of the tree this is what a leaf of a redwood looks like that you normally see within a couple meters 10 20 feet off the ground looks like this but if you go 200 feet up in a redwood tree the leaves look like that and, it, and here's one figure in that paper. What you're seeing in this figure, is the numbers are the meters above ground. So two meters, six feet, give or take, above ground, the leaves look like this. Well, if you go up to 35 meters, now you're up to like 100 feet, looks like about like that. Go up all the way to over 300 feet, 112 meters right there. And there are these teeny little all shaped needle like leaves that you would barely recognize as a redwood uh, leaf. And so what's going on here is, it, is that there's actually potentially a physiological limit to tree height. First of all, I should mention that trees are more than sufficiently engineered to grow way taller than we currently know them to be. If you think about this, this 300 foot tall redwood, how wide is the base of that redwood? What's the, it's, it, what's the diameter of a 300 foot tall redwood? Well, it's like 30 feet. It's a 10 to one ratio of height to diameter. That's nothing, right? There's palms out in the world where they have a hundred to one ratio. Cells are really strong. And, all, and, and so the, the ratio there, it can be much more. They're engineered for, for, for a ton of height. But maybe there's this physiological limit. And this is a, another figure in which they showed, basically they, they measured the CO2 outside the leaf and the amount of CO2 outside the leaf goes up and up. Water availability and photosynthetic efficiency go down, down, down as you go up, up in a tree. And, and the leaf density, which I just showed you, goes up. And all of those converge at a point at, at um, 130 meters above the ground, 425 feet. And unless the laws of physics change on the planet, that's the tallest tree you'll ever get on planet Earth is 425 feet, which is fascinating because they're dug firs that were fell and then measured when they're on the ground to be over 400 feet tall in the past. And, and so potentially trees have actually a, a reached this physiological limit and the tallest trees now known are not at that physiological limit, but they could be, they could be, um, uh, you know, given another thousand years, be up over 400 feet. So another question to think about is how do sugars made in the leaves end up in different parts of the plant? So if you have, um, if you have sugars, tons of sugars being made, they have to make it to places where sugars can't be made. Things not out in, in the open air and in the sunlight where they can make all their own sugars. Well, what is that? That's the entire half of the plant underground, but it's also other places you may not think about like the vascular cambium and the cork cambium, or even new developing leaves or, or flowers and fruits, all of those require sugar inputs. And so how do they, how do they make their way around? And if, we, and if we go back to this, this anatomy again of a leaf, there's our upper epidermis, lower epidermis, there's the vasculature, here's all the photosynthetic cells. You got those stomata on the lower surface. Well, all those photosynthetic cells there, they're just factories for sugar. They're pumping it out. Sugar is very readily available in photosynthetic leaves, and, and, and that has to be somehow moved to other parts of it. And sugars are, are loaded into the phloem in leaves. Not very many plant cells are very far from xylem and phloem. They have to be close to xylem and phloem because then sugar is loaded into the phloem and water is taken out of the xylem, and sugars are transported in the phloem. I said earlier that water is transported in the xylem passively upward pulled upward by the process of transpiration, well, sugars are actively transported in the phloem. And what is sugar? What, and typically, 90% um, of the dry matter in the phloem is sugar. So there's other things in there. There's hormones and, and, and other organic molecules, but mostly it's sugar. And mostly in most plants, it's a dimer between glucose and fructose, fructose that dimer that we call sucrose, table sugar. That's what's being moved around long distances in the phloem in, uh, in plants. And we know that from some cool experiments in which you, if you take an aphid, and an aphid 
is an, is an awesome insect that's adapted to be able to sense phloem, stick its mouthpiece and style it right down into the phloem and start to drink the sugar water out of the phloem. And, and not only does it drink the sugar water, it doesn't even have to suck very much. The sugar water just rushes into the aphid and it eats and drinks and eats and drinks and then eventually just starts to poop out sugar water. And some of you may have had the experience of actually being under a tree that's got a ton of aphids on it and you, it's just raining sugar water. Guess what though? That's not really sugar water, it's aphid poop that's raining on you. And ants know this, right? Ants. Ants farm aphids, they move them around and stuff like that so they can drink the, the, the sugar water that comes out of the anus of the, uh, of the aphid. Well, if you take that mouth stylet, you can actually cut the aphid off its mouthpiece and continue to, to, to drip what, what's coming out of the phloem and people have analyzed that and it's a bunch of sucrose. Well, that's where all the sugar is being moved around and it's being moved around actively. And what I mean by actively is that it's being pumped across membranes. Phloem is living tissue. Xylem, the transport cells in xylem, trachids and vessel elements are dead. But in phloem, those the transport cells, the sieve tube members, they're alive. What do I mean by they're alive? Well, they have functioning membranes inside of them. And so things just can't go in and out of them. They have to be pumped across those membranes. And, and, and the reason why phloem cells have to have membranes in them, they have membranes and they have these specialized little companion cells that, that help that, that transport cell work. Well, they have to have membranes because flow, in the phloem, sugar is pumped in, in higher and higher concentrations against a concentration gradient. It's not going down in a concentration gradient. It's being pumped against a concentration gradient. And that's re required because sugar needs to be moved from sources to sinks. And sources in, in, in of sugar in plants are mature leaves that are doing photosynthesis and they have a ton of, uh, uh, of, sugar, uh, of sugar in them. And sinks are things like the entire root ball flowers, fruits, young leaves, and so on. And so the, the sugar is moving in phloem, not just down. It's moving everywhere. It's moving up, it's moving down. The directionality is irrelevant with regards to up and down. It's just from a source to a sink. Roots are massive sinks. So a lot of the sugar goes down towards roots, but it's from sources to sinks. And if we zoom back in on our, on our leaf and we look at uh, here, upper epidermis, lower epidermis, here's the phloem where all the sugar is being made, it's being actively pumped across membrane, across membrane against a concentration gradient until you get a huge amount of sugar put into a cell of the phloem. So, and, and what happens if you've loaded a phloem cell with a ton of, uh, of sucrose? You've effectively lowered the water concentration there. So water comes out of the xylem, xylem and phloem always run next to each other. Water comes out of the xylem and it follows the sucrose into that phloem cell, further increasing the pressure in that phloem cell. And so the pressure in the phloem at the end where the sources are in the leaves is very high. And as sugar is being offloaded in areas like the roots or, or areas where sugar is being used, the pressure is very low. So high pressure in the phloem, loading of sugar, and, and the sugar molecules here are these little red dots, Sucrose is loaded, loaded across the membrane. Higher and higher concentration, water is rushing in there. You get high concentration and then low concentration of areas where, where sugar is either being used or offloaded and polymerized into starch as it is, as is often the case. And so if you have a tube that has high concentration and high pressure on one end of the tube and low pressure on the other end of the tube, what's gonna happen? Well, bulk flow is going to happen in which you go when, uh, from high pressure to low pressure, water is going to move and all the sugar and everything dissolved in that water is also going to move. And so xylem and phloem, which always run right next to each other, as soon as the sugar is offloaded and being used, as you're loading sugar off of there, you're effectively increasing the water concentration in the phloem and it goes back to the xylem and will move in the xylem stream upward and around in the plant to where it is once again moved into the phloem. So that's why xylem and phloem, 
Xylem never occurs without phloem next to it and phloem never without xylem next to it because they're both crucial for the movement of water through trees in which you have, this looks like a cross section from what I showed you earlier in which you have xylem and phloem running right next to each other in a stem. Here's from earlier in this talk in which you have this xylem and phloem in a polar star in the middle of, in the steel of the central column of, of roots. And because carbohydrates are made in leaves, and you get this loading of phloem in the leaves, you get phloem pu uh, sugar pushed around in the phloem. Meanwhile, transpiration is constantly happening. Leaves are out in the sun during the day, water is being lost from them, and there's a pull, like pulling an icicle through a tube, pulling a string through a tube, whatever you want to call it, a pull of water upward from, from that. And, and, um, and with that, I'll summarize this and say that roots, have specialized tissues that allow them to function in the soil environment, different from stems. Roots are different from stems in that regard. Trees transpire water through their stomata, which pulls water upward in their tissues. If, if water didn't cohere to itself, if water wasn't sticky to itself, there'd be mo no water tension in the world and the world would be a very weird place. But also water couldn't move up in trees in that case. And so water has to stick to itself for this whole thing to work. Water moves passively upward from the soil, through trees, through xylem, in that cohesion tension. What I mean by passively is not a molecule of energy burnt in order for it to happen. Pumping sugar across a membrane requires ATP and it requires energy. So moving sugar in the phloem, you burn energy. Trees burn energy to, to do that. Well, that's no big deal because that, all that sugar is a bunch of energy, so it's fine. But the passive movement of water is driven by evaporation and transpiration from the sun up above. And sugars made in the leaves, which are sources, are actively transported in living, conductive, conducting cells, sieve tube elements, and so on, of the phloem to areas where sugars are used and or stored in those, in those areas. And so um, that's a summary of water and plants. That's, a, that's like a five-week lecture series that I did in an hour right there. If you're more confused and you know less about water now than you did an hour ago, I'm sorry about that. But hopefully you will leave this thinking, thinking there is a weird guy who knows a lot about water in plants. And then you can email me and I can help you with questions and so on. And you, and you remember my contact information. And, um, and I told you earlier that I write books and I, and I sell books and to, to, to get people interested in plants. We, I, I carried two boxes of books here thinking I'm going to have to carry these two boxes of books back. And it turns out I didn't. We sold them all. But if you were interested in getting a book from me, then my, my publisher is called Pacific Street Publishing. All the books I've written are there. And, um, and they've told me to say, say to you guys that I will sign all the books that are bought and for the next two weeks before they get mailed out, if you want to do that. And so, um, so Pacific Street Publishing is where these books that I've written are. And with that, I'll say thank you for listening and we're gonna answer some questions. <clears throat> this time, Tom, I left two minutes, so yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, sort of. Okay, so um, I'm going to go back to the mic and say, I'm, I'm going to try to paraphrase your question. As it gets really hot, I didn't, I didn't hear the next phrase, but you said something like stomata closed. Is that what you said? Yeah. Totally different in different types of trees, but, but it depends on how adapted they are to heat and drought and those types of things. One physiological adaptation to extreme heat is closing of stomata. And you can still get dieback in that situation. What, what, is, what, what is toxic for plants in extreme heat is not necessarily water and, and problems with water. What's toxic for plants in extreme heat can be um, 
oxygen radicals and other problems associated with photosynthesis in the leaf in which the leaves begin to shut down and the leaf, uh, all the proteins around the photosynthetic arrays fall apart and then they don't recover and then and, and you get death of leaves. So death of leaves over a large period of uh, area looks ultimately like death of the stems and dieback in extreme heat events that, that can happen. Uh, and that has uh, less to do with water than it has to do with if, and maybe some of you've had this experience in which you've had a house plant you take your house plant and you set it out in the full sun. What happens to the house plant? It gets fried, right? But if you take the house plant and you slowly move it out into the sun over a period of a week or two, it doesn't get fried. Well, that's because of physiological adaptations the plant have for dealing with that photosynthetic array and all the oxygen radicals. Taking photons of light and hitting a leaf with it is a very dangerous situation for all those cells. And so there's many proteins that help shepherd that whole thing and not help, help the leaf not light on fire and have all kinds of problems with it. But those take time to build. And so heat snaps over short periods of time just destroy the whole photosynthetic pro, uh, um, array of uh, proteins and all of that and burn the leaves. And then you get dieback associated with that. So, so even though their, their stomata closed down because of extreme heat, the really the problem there is 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 other problems as well and then if you st begin to talk about well outside trees but there's uh, there plants that have different adaptations for opening and closing stomata there's a whole kind of photosynthesis which we call cam photosynthesis in which the stomata are just closed during the day entirely they don't allow any co2 to come in during the day they only allow it to come in at night so that during the day the stomata are closed and no water is left from those plants during the day there are very few cam photosynthesis trees but there are many cam photosynthesis plants that exist in very hot dry environments you can't get a tree without water it actually is a violation of the laws of physics for a tr large trees to exist in very dry areas where do large trees exist? They exist in wet, high rainfall, riparian areas where water is readily available. But there are plants that exist outside of those areas and they usually have fascinating ways of dealing with the, their stomata. Yes. They are, yeah, yeah. So not only are they not taking moving water upward during the night, they aren't moving a water upward during whole periods of the year when they don't have leaves on them. So, so deciduous trees, the stream of upward water, pretty much for the most part ends. Water gets lost somewhat from stems, and, and, and but that whole time of the year, the water in the xylem sits there. The, the chain of water is unbroken still, but the water just sits there. All the buds, all the leaves fall off. All the buds are covered up by bud scales, protecting them. In very cold areas, there's an awesome adaptation that happens. Have you guys ever thought about this when you're on the ski slopes? I don't know if you ski. I don't ski, but I picture, you guys look like skiers. You, you, you're, you're, you're looking at all these trees and it's like minus 10, let's say. Why aren't the trees popping? It's a column of water. It's a column of water. What happens when you take a column of water full of sugar and you put it in the freezer? I'm talking about like a Coke can. It expands and it breaks the can, right? So why aren't the trees popping everywhere? And there's some trees that exist at minus 40 degrees for six months at a time. How do they survive that? Well, the answer to that is that they just pack the water with so much sugar in the xylem and everything, the xylem, the sapwood, all of that is filled, the water is filled with so much sugar that the freezing point, that it doesn't freeze. And then, and then what happens is once they break the buds and the transpiration stream starts again, it starts again in early, er, er, early spring, late winter. Well, all the xylem is filled with sugar at that point and you can jam a nail into it and run it out and you call it maple syrup, right? If you cook it down, 
That, that, that is because of that adaptation of surviving the winter and not exploding. But it's also the result of water stopping for uh, the water is not moving. Not only is it not moving at night, but it is not moving entirely during the, the deciduous portion of the year. Wait, hang on, you guys water deciduous trees during the winter? Wait, uh, yeah, no, you, you water deciduous trees during the winter. Why? Well, there's a small amount of water loss potentially through through those bud scales and so on. There's potentially a small amount of water loss through lenticels and and some of the cork tissue on the on the smaller stems. But I mean. I mean, well, if somebody's paying you to water them, then fine. Yeah, I get it. That's that, that's fine. I'm not. I'm not sure. Has anybody done the experiment? Don't water them during the winter and see what happens. Do you get yelled at or they die? Those are two very different things. Yeah. So okay. So yeah. The root growth is a thing, but is uh, the soil so dry that, that, okay, all right. Matt Ritter, welcome to the, the, the Intermountain West <laughs> is what, what's going on here. Yeah, that, that's, the, um, if the soil is so dry that you're not getting root growth and root growth is crucial during that time, although it's not very crucial, to be honest with you, a, a lot of root growth in deciduous trees is not happening. There, there is potentially a small amount I'm I'm just calling this entire practice that you guys are doing into question. I'm a skeptical dude, though, I, and you and you you know you, it's it's totally fine. It could be real, but 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 the water loss. I'll tell you right now, the water loss of trees during the deciduous time time of that tree is known, and it is very small. Yes. It's bone. The, the soil is bone dry during this time of year. Yeah. Yeah. But it's trees that are deciduous and not growing. No, during that time is what I'm asking you. In the fall, those trees are deciduous. They aren't. They they aren't growing anymore. Yeah. All right. Well, um, yeah. I don't know what to tell you uh, that 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 um, you could you could replicate that very easy in a nursery experiment, and and you could see how. Um, how valuable that practice is, and it might be, and 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 um, and I'm skeptical, but so what? I don't know as much as you do about the way to grow trees here. That's fine, and 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 I I would say let this be a lesson to me and you, which is skepticism is important, right? Why are you doing the practices that you're doing? Is something you should be thinking about all the time. Are you guys not thinking that you are, right? You're thinking what? What is the point here? What am I doing? Am I wasting water? Is this important? Have I seen trees suffer that didn't, this did not happen to? What's going on on a more global level? I have a number of 10 trees that I know, but I need 100 to be able to answer this question. I need some statistical re reality here in order to answer this. And so all those things are things you should be thinking. And I, I could easily, I could be wrong here. I know I'm not wrong about the physiology, but I could be wrong about the Intermountain West, the soil moisture at the time when the trees are going dormant and that they are still slightly growing. That's all things to consider. So yeah, before I get hung up here, I, 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 I uh, I want to stop this conversation because I, you guys know more than I do about about the specific uh, specific thing here. So, yeah, yeah. Um, one, let's do one. You no, know, one more question. Was it about that topic? And you're 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 over it. Yeah. One more question, all the way in the back, and we'll that'll be the last one. 
the speed and amount of water that moves through a tree is actually a genetically determined thing associated with the size of the, the cells that make up the xylem. And so you, a, a juniper that's in full water, you cannot increase the speed of the, of the water that going up in the body of the juniper by putting more water in the ground. It's, it, it's, it, if it's, it, it has, every tree has a maximum. And so a cottonwood will be much different than a juniper. It'll move water much more, much quicker. And it'll, it, uh, and so increasing the water to a cottonwood up to a point, and then it, and then it plateaus. And so if, if the, the tree has all the water it needs, additional watering won't matter. And I don't even know if I answered your question at all, but I, If you're overwatering trees, the water is leaving the environment, not through the body of the tree, too. It's leaving the, the, the environment through runoff. It's leaving the water, the environment through other plants, through evaporation, through all kinds of things, and not transpiration. And the, the relationship between evaporation and transpiration, evapotranspiration, let's call it, is not only in the body of the tree, but in the environment and so on. And so overwatering, the water just goes elsewhere. <laughs> we, yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, I really, I don't know. In that case, I, I, I would have to look at it more closely. So, yeah. Oh, here's another thing which is crucial to, to understand, and, and we'll just make this the last one. That 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 um, roots need oxygen, right? Roots cells are on, undergoing the breakdown of sugar to make energy, right? A process we call respiration. Well, you can't break down sugar and make energy in the absence of oxygen. You can in anaerobic respiration, but that's not going on in roots. What's going on in roots is they need oxygen. And so if you put so much water in soil that, that, that uh, and, and oxygen diffuses into water very poorly, if, you get, if you've created a situation in which all the oxygen in and amongst the air particles within the soil is filled up with water, then, then you can suffocate roots in that case, suffocate them from oxygen. And so many plants just can't even live in waterlogged soils at all because of that reason. So additional wa unnecessary water in waterlogged soils is a big mistake. Yes. Yep. Yep. You can have you can have reverse uh, osmosis, basically, of water leaving roots out into out into soil. It not only can it leave out into to to dry soils, but it can leave out into salty soils. All kinds of things in which you reduce the water concentration in the environment and around the rhizosphere. It's another possibility. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you all for listening, and uh, thanks for that great discussion.